Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Safety Artisan. And today we're going to be having a webinar uh, about uh, OSHA and HHA. And we'll find out what OSHA and they are in just a moment. So I'm just going to start my presentation for you. So here's what we're going to do today. Workplace hazard analysis, which we're going to be looking at tasks 206 and 207 of MIL standard 882E. As it says, it's a free webinar from the Safety Artisan. In fact, just a sec, before we, before we go any further, I'm just going to double check. Ah, oh, brilliant. Thank you very much, Harry. That's that's good. I did a webinar once where half of it, nobody could hear a thing because I hadn't checked my settings. So thank you very much, Harry. I'm glad you can hear me. Right, let's go back to sharing the screen. So we're going to be talking this morning about workplace hazard analysis. Now, all of the tasks in MIL standard 882E, that's system safety engineering, all of the 200 series analysis tasks will impact the workplace in some way because they're analysing the, the system that we're going to be using, that the workers, the end users are going to be using. But tasks 206 and 207 in particular are all about looking at workplace effects. So we'll get on to that. So first of all, a quick word about myself. Why should you be listening to me at all? You know, what, uh, what, uh, what background, what pedigree have I got to talk to you about safety? So I've been in the business a long time, as it says, 25 years. And I've worked on a lot of different stuff, lots of different aircraft. Uh, I did 20 years in the Air Force. And so I've worked on fast jets, transport aircraft, reconnaissance aircraft, helicopters, uh, no drones, but lots of different aircraft. Uh, surface ships, submarines, air traffic management systems, and a little bit of trains and road vehicles, not much, um, but software for years and years. So software in all of these things or considering them. And I've worked on some really small programs, which is lovely, really enjoy working on small programs where one person can do everything. Um, but I've also worked on some gigantic uh, programs as well. So Eurofighter Typhoon, for example, and future the Australian Future Submarine. And um, as some of you may know, Future Submarine program failed. So I'm here to bring you the, my experience of things going wrong and learning from that, as well as things going right, which I think is, is important because nothing goes right all the time. We shouldn't pretend it does. And in terms of where I've worked, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from the UK. I've worked in the UK for many years and I've been working in Australia on system safety for more than 10 years now. And I've worked on a large number of US and European programs. So in terms of teaching, I've been very privileged to teach hundreds of Ministry of Defence people safety because I was uh, I was on the team that had the contract. And I've now got more than 3,000 students online. So very happy about that. That's well, that's lovely. I love reaching out to people. As I said in the introduction, it's great that we can all sit here at home and do this like a little high-tech cottage industry. I think that's a, a, a wonderful anachronism, but, but fun nevertheless. Uh, and yeah, and I've got to present various safety topics at conferences. So that's enough about me. Let's move on. OK, so how how do we do workplace hazard analysis? So first of all, we need to uh, just mention that there's, if you like, there's analysis at the workplace and then there's analysis of the workplace, the future workplace during acquisition when we're buying or developing a system. So first of all, the workplace analysis, there are two very common types of analysis that you will see around the world. And so the first one is job safety analysis, which is a process that you can apply, as it suggests, to any job that you're doing. So before you start doing a job, you sort of think, oh, well, what are the, 
what what are the what are the risks here? What could go wrong? Um, how do we you know manage that? And uh, so there's a link there to the Canadian OHNS people um, that have got an explanation about uh, JSA. And uh, all these links, by the way, are in the text. They're all in the uh, in the chat. Uh, if for any reason you can't access those, access those, then send me a message, please, on social media. I'll share. I'll share the. Um, I'll share the links on social media anyway. Then secondly, uh, for more involved analysis, there's a tool called a safe work method statement. And certainly in Australia, this is meant for high risk work. So it's actually a, a, a legislative requirement that if you're doing high risk work, you should use a safe work method statement. And if you go to the Safe Work Australia website in the link there uh, and in, in the chat is a link to an example safe work method statement and if we if we have time we'll, we'll look at those examples later and by the way wherever you are i highly recommend safe work australia website because it's a treasure trove of really high quality resources and really readable stuff very well written stuff so even if english is not your first language you'll find some really useful and readable stuff there. So really accessible. So that's doing stuff at the workplace when you're a worker and end user. But uh, I'm going to spend uh, most of my slides today talking about the other stuff, which is acquisition analysis uh, of work on a system. So I'm going to, and we're going to talk about workplace analysis later, don't worry. But, but for now, I'm going to talk about this acquisition approach where we, I assume that we're, we're working on a system, um, maybe a piece of military equipment, but it may not be because you'll, you'll find similar standards for, for everything. So there's two tasks we're going to look at. So 206 is operating and support analysis or OSHA, uh, OSHA. Um, not to be confused with the US regulator of, of workplace health and safety. And then task 207 is health hazard analysis, which, as it implies, is looking at all things that could hurt people. And actually, these two tasks fit in also nicely with the environmental hazard analysis task, which is task 210, because they're all looking at things that can hurt people or the environment or you know other, other animals. So they all fit together really well. But we're not going to be talking about environmental hazard analysis today, just these two safety things. So our focus is on hurting people or not hurting people, sorry. So let's look at OSHA task 206. And I'll let you read that. So this is a quotation taken from the standard. And the purpose of it is to, as it says, identify and assess, evaluate hazards introduced by those operating and support activities. So we've got people doing stuff with the system. What hazards could arise from that? And secondly, we have to evaluate the adequacy of those things that we put in place to mitigate those risks, to control those hazards. So whether it be procedures, facilities, processes, or other equipment that we've got, safety equipment maybe, personal protective equipment, whatever it might be, we need to assess how effective those are in the context of doing the ONS work. So very important task can be a very involved task, as we'll see in a moment. So I'm not going to go into a huge bunch of depth about the OSHA task today. If you want that, then there's an OSHA lesson uh, and there's an HHA lesson as well. And you can buy individual lessons or you can go for a, a bundle of lessons. So this is just a taster, but I'm using slides from the, uh, the actual lesson. So I picked out a couple of comment slides in terms of adding value. OK, so a couple of hints and tips about using task two and six. Uh, as I say, we haven't got time to go all the way through task 206 in this webinar. 
But if you are using it, it can be very, very important. These days, a lot of the time, we are not developing new systems. We're either buying a legacy system from somewhere else and using it, or we're buying something that's off the shelf, commercial off the shelf, or military or government off the shelf. Now, in which case, we may not have any access to design information whatsoever. So we're very, very dependent on just looking at the system that we've got almost as a black box and saying, OK, OSHA, what are we going to do with it What are, to operate it and to support it? What's going to be involved? And so this task takes on enormous significance because it might be the only in-depth safety analysis work we can do at all. So task 206 is going to be very important for these kind of systems. And it's still worth mentioning, by the way, if you saw, an, I've done earlier webinars on the earlier tasks, you still, even if you've got a legacy or cost system, we still need to do those initial three tasks. We need to do the preliminary hazard identification where we generate a hazard list, that's task 201. We need to do task 202, which is preliminary hazard analysis. And we need to do task 203, which is system requirements hazard analysis. And uh, I think the, uh, the webinar that I did on those three tasks together is still available online. We'll talk about that later. So um, we still need to do the basics, but then task 206 is going to be enormously important if we don't have any design information. Second point to notice with task 206 is that the danger is you can analyze everything to death. And on a complex system, you can spend endless amounts of money on this, going into vast amounts of detail. So the way to avoid doing that and spending lots of money to not get much back, first of all, we often need to prioritize OSHA work. OK, and as it says, if we can use other hazard analysis, remember 201, 202, 203. If we can use those other earlier, much cheaper and quicker hazard analysis techniques to identify the biggest risks, we can prioritize those and say, OK, what was the real risks with these system? Maybe I've got some really nasty chemicals in it. Um, maybe there's moving parts where people can get their hands or fingers crushed. You know, maybe there's radiation or heat or lasers or whatever it might be. More on that later. So we can prioritize and apply the OSHA proportionately to get the results that we need to understand the risks. OK, whereas maybe for some more mundane tasks where really the risks are sort of cuts and grazes and, you know, people falling over when they're not working at height or stuff like that, maybe stuff that isn't quite so serious. We, we do less work there or, or none at all, maybe. The other thing we can do is recognise that we don't have to analyse everything. Very often our, our industry, whichever industry we're in, has developed standard approaches to doing certain kinds of work. So there's nothing to stop us taking uh, those standard approaches, if they're appropriate, and just go, OK, we won't bother doing any hazard analysis for this task because there's a standard way of work of doing this in the industry, OK, or that we know about. We'll just apply that to get the safe results. Don't need to spend any money on analysis. OK, now I know that I know that sounds like uh, the opposite that uh, a, a safety engineer should be saying. But we don't want to be doing analysis for the sake of it because it's a waste of time. It's a waste of money and it brings safety into disrepute. OK, so if people see that we're spending lots of their money for no real benefit, they're not going to like that. And then they're not going to listen to us. So when we want to talk about something that really is important, we may not get listened to. So we've always got to think about delivering benefit value for money for our end users and our customers or our, our, the organization we work for. Uh, and applying safety proportionately and sensibly is, you know, and is, is essential to doing that. So that's a little bit about OSHA.
or OSHA. Let's move on to health hazard analysis. And again, this is a quote from the standard from 882E. And as it says, we identify human health hazards. We evaluate hazardous materials and processes that are proposed for the system. And we propose measures to eliminate the hazards or reduce the risks if we can't eliminate the hazards. And very often we cannot eliminate the hazards. Now, again, I don't have time because it's a full HHA is a, a big subject. And I think this is the I think the, um, the lesson I do on task 207 uh, is, is almost a full hour. In fact, it might be more than an hour because it is such a big, complex subject. So we don't have time for that here. I've just got a couple of slides to help you. But that's basically what we're trying to do. So as I said, oh, sorry, I've just said all of this. The lesson is long. There's a lot of stuff in health hazard analysis. So there's hazardous materials or hazardous chemicals, has chem, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there's ergonomics. So we're thinking about, first of all, anthropometrics which is, you know, how tall or short or how far can a human reach? Um, you know, the size of human beings, do they fit in the vehicle? Or do Can they reach all the controls? Can they, you know, can they reach up to do the work that maintenance or whatever that's required? So there's the anthropometrics, which is, you know, the size of people. And people do vary in size quite dramatically. Uh, and then secondly, there's the wider ergonomics of, you know, repetitive strain injury, musculoskeletal disorders, where we're asking people to move stuff or twist or stretch, and people can hurt themselves doing that, uh, or trying to get into uh, very hard to access spaces. So we can introduce hazards by um, having hard to, to access or hard to work on places. Uh, and I've certainly seen, you know, plenty of that in my career in the Air Force, yeah, there was an infamous uh, area inside a, a tornado aircraft called Zone 19. And it was you, you, the ground crew to do any work in there had to remove a piece of equipment. And then you stood up inside this thing, which was pitch black. You couldn't see a thing and there was no lighting. And then the, the in order to do certain jobs, the ground crew actually had to stand up and do the job over their shoulder. So using a screwdriver and stuff to fix stuff behind them in the dark because there was no room to do anything else you couldn't actually work like that there wasn't there just wasn't enough room in zone 19 so they had to do all the work like that which was crazy as you can imagine they eliminated that zone in later designs of the aircraft but uh, so yeah so you can have some you can have some weird stuff in terms of access so we also think about the operating environment you know, so we might be in a, a cold environment, wet, windy, hot and dry, dusty, uh, and so and also for the military, of course, they will be thinking about uh, nuclear, biological, and chemical contamination. So, do people have to work in protective gear, whatever that might be? Uh, and of course, if it's very hot and you're wearing protective gear, you know, fatigue is going to set in very quickly. And again, having done this, it can be very, very unpleasant. So we shouldn't be asking people to work for a long time in heat in that gear. And then finally, of course, radiation. So whether that be uh, uh, non-ionizing radiation, so, you know, radio frequency, radars, radios, etc., or it could be ionizing radiation. Maybe we've got a radioactive source. Um, we have radioactive sources, small ones in smoke detectors, but they're also used industrially for all sorts of reasons. So we can have and, and so electrical switch gear can emit X-rays and things like this. So there's a wide range of radiation that we might have to deal with. Uh, and of course, people fear and dread radiation because we can't sense it. So that's always going to be a very sensitive topic. And there are very strict rules about managing radiation. So we've got to know our stuff. We've got to know what the regulations are and follow them very closely. 
Uh, and there's, there's more stuff in the full lesson than this, but I just picked those ones out. So a couple of slides of, of commentary or advice. The first thing to note is because 882 is a US standard, it's written with US legal requirements and legal framework in mind. Now, that's, complica that's complex in the US because the US is a federal state. So some things are ruled by the federal government, uh, but a lot of health and safety stuff is ruled by state and territory or state government, sorry, in the US. It's similar in Australia. We have a federal government and we have states and territories which are somewhat independent and they can make their own rules, which can be all, you know, vary the rules, which can be different. I mean, we're lucky in Australia in that we have WHS, we have Workplace Health and Safety, which is a standardised approach to health and safety in Australia and very, very useful, very clear and easy to read. So if you're um, whichever jurisdiction you're in, you're going to need to tailor Task 207 to suit the jurisdiction than the rules that you've got to obey. And the process by which you do that is you do task 203. Remember the safety requirements, system requirements, hazard analysis. So not only do you look at the requirements for the system in that task, you look at your legal requirements and all the regulations and standards that you may have to apply. So that's why you still need to do task 203. Now, uh, if you're in a country uh, where the rules are lax or, or don't exist, uh, you could do much worse than looking at Australian WHS because there's a lot of good common sense stuff in there. And there's a lot of free resources at Safe Work Australia. So uh, if you're not sure what to do, if you've got latitude, wriggle room in what you do, but you want to do something good, then I, I would recommend going and having a look at, at, at Safe Work Australia and you'll get lots of good guidance there whether you are obliged to do it in your country or not. So, um, and as it says, tailoring those requirements to the local jurisdiction will be crucial to achieving compliance with, with local regulations, whatever they may be. Yeah, so I spend a lot of time in the, in the lesson commenting on tailoring for WHS and, and other uh, jurisdictions. So that's that one. So just the second one. Again, we need to set scope and priorities because if you go into this and just go, well, I'm going to do everything to an equal depth, you're going to spend a lot of money and you're probably going to waste a lot of money and a lot of time and which will not make you popular. So as another reminder, we still need to do those first three quick, cheap, uh, tasks in order to uh, understand our priorities. So advice here, some of this work can be quite specialised. So either, yes, we can read the books and we can learn how to do it and we can do the work, but it will probably be, uh, it will probably require quite an investment in time to do that. So be ready for the more specialist stuff, maybe like maybe the radiation stuff or whatever it might be in your area. Maybe there's a, there's a particularly demanding thing that you've discovered. Maybe you get somebody, a specialist in to do that work. You know, they, they may cost a lot of money, but they're probably going to do the job a lot quicker. Second thing to say is it's very easy to get worried about certain things, um, particularly some hazardous chemicals. So people get very worried about lead, like, you know, lead solder or asbestos or cadmium, chromium, those sorts of things. And there's a good reason for that. And then certainly in Australia, the Australian Department of Defence is absolutely paranoid about hazardous chemicals um, because we had a, a Haschem scandal uh, some years ago where several hundred defence workers uh, were, um, you know, poisoned with uh, hazardous chemicals and it affected their health um, quite badly in some cases. So that was a big scandal. And as a result, the Department of Defence here is, 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 is very switched on, very hot on this topic. However, 
we have to remember that even if we have got these nasties present in our system, there's actually got to be a, a path for the nasties to get to a human being and often for the human being to either breathe them in or eat them or get them in a cut or something in order to be poisoned or to be affected. So there's got to be a, a, a credible exposure path to uh, for anybody to get hurt. So the, the top tip here is don't go overboard just because you've got a hazardous chemical present in the system. Look at, is there actually a way that this stuff could, could hurt somebody, could get to a person, hurt them? And if there isn't, you know, so we've got, you know, we've got cadmium plated connectors in a lot of US sourced electronics because it's, it's still perfectly legal there. But the reality is those there's very little cadmium. It's locked away inside an electronic box and actually you'd have to eat it or, or slash yourself with it to get it into your system in order to hurt you. So in, it's not going to happen, OK, in normal business. Whereas there's some other things where if you've got, uh, you know, the uh, the starter system on, a, on I think, an F-16, is a, it, it, you start the engine with something called hydrazine, which is a very dangerous and volatile substance. Uh, and, you know, because it's a liquid, you've got to, you know, the ground crew have got to handle it. They've got to top up the hydrazine tank on the aircraft, et cetera, et cetera. And it produces noxious gases, et cetera. So there is a credible exposure path there. People have got to handle this stuff. They could get hurt. So that's as for so as an example, that's something you would spend a lot of time working on, making sure that you had adequate procedures and protective gear for your maintenance staff to be able to handle that kind of thing, because there is a credible exposure path. The other thing to remember is that in normal use, most of the nasties are locked away and they're quite safe. But if there's been an accident or some sort of damage to your system or it's caught fire, that can change everything fire especially you know the high energy exposure can change chemical compounds produce gases and smoke and particles it can change even relatively harmless chemical stable chemical compounds into something much nastier so think about that okay what's a credible damage or accident scenario do we you know if we if we're cleaning up an accident do we need to take extra precautions and therefore do we need to buy some stuff in advance? Our emergency preparedness, do we need to be able to cope with hazardous materials at the crash site or at the accident site or after the fire and cleaning up as well? Do we need, you know, do people need to wear breathing protection or a hazmat suit or whatever it might be? So do think about those things. They happen, obviously, we hope very rarely, um, but they can be very, very serious. And that's often when, you know, the hazardous chemicals can, can really get exposed to people. So there's some words about those two tasks, which I hope you found useful. So uh, next steps, I've got a few resources to help you. And all of these links are in the chat, by the way. So uh, there's a number of stuff. If you go to, I'll, I'll tell you the website in a moment. You can, uh, you can get a free preliminary hazard identification and analysis guide, so which I produced. I've just done a new free download on system safety concepts and principles, which is a, uh, it's a couple of videos and some resources there. And you can get an email notification about all of these things by uh, subscribing for free to the Safety Artisan. And again, follow the link in the uh, in the chat and uh, or you can go to the website www.safetyartisan.com. And there's lots of free resources on the website uh, and there's paid lessons and whole courses as well. So you can get so I've talked about tasks 201, 202, 203, 206 and 207. You can get any one of those lessons uh, on its own for 45 US dollars, uh, or you can get bundles at a further discount. And in fact, if you go and subscribe for free uh, for the emails, 
you will um, get much bigger discounts. You'll get a 60% discount on most of the courses on the website. So big discount available, subscription is free. And also you'll, I'll keep you updated on what's coming up and what, what's new and what comes out. So a little plug there. So lots of resources for you there at the Safety Artisan. So I just wanted to say, we have got some time left, so we will we will look at some further things. Uh, the next one, this is part of a series of webinars. The final webinar in this series is next month in July. Uh, hazard analysis within systems engineering. And I'll be doing that on the, it's the 12th of July if you're in the US and the 13th uh, pretty much everywhere else. So I say the US, North and South America, and Central America, it'll be the 12th. Uh, it's the 13th of July everywhere else. And I will be looking at tasks 204, 205 and 209. So that's subsystem, system and system of systems has an analysis. So we will look at all of those things and we will look at them within the framework of systems engineering. Okay. Now all of MIL standard 882E is designed to work within systems engineering. That's why it's called system safety. Um, but those three tasks especially fit very closely with the specification and testing requirements and testing process that's built in to the systems engineering v model or any other systems engineering model that you want to use so we think very much about the front end of as we decompose the system we think about the requirements that we need to meet and then on the right hand side of the v we think about verifying those requirements and ultimately validating the entire system or system of systems okay so those three tasks 204 205 and 209 are really going to help us with the safety of highly complex systems uh, and i've done i've done this type of work for real and, and it's challenging but it's very very interesting and exciting work to do so i'll share some of that with you i hope okay so we've got oh, we're going to break now for questions and answers and it says ask me anything within well you can ask me anything i might i might not know the answer so we're going to do some questions and answers now and let me get back to there we go so we have got uh, an opportunity now. so feel free if you've got any questions on those uh, what is my system oh, stop that right no go away Sorry about that, that's Windows playing up. Right, so, right, I've got rid of that. Right, sorry about that. So, have you got any questions about what we've just talked about? So, if you're on uh, Greg, I think you can send me a question in the private chat. And Harry and everybody else who's online, you should be able to send me a question. Chat. Uh, if you can't for any reason, I think if you're on Facebook and YouTube, you're, I'm not sure what's going on with LinkedIn. We are there on LinkedIn. If you can't send me a question, then um, by all means, send me a question through social media or go to the website. And uh, if you go to the contact page, you can uh, you can leave or you can leave a comment on anything content on the um, on the website or you can send me a question by submitting a form and I'll get back to you and that will come through to my email and I'll send you an email reply. So any questions at all? Well, I'll let you have a think about that. So what we'll, what we'll do then is we'll move on and I will go back to sharing my screen. So if we move on, I mentioned that we would have a look, quick look at these two techniques, job safety analysis and the safe work method statement. Now, if we look at these things, so here we are, we're on the job safety analysis page, as you can see, uh, for the Canadian Center for OHS. Very good. And uh, let's start, as it says, a job safety analysis is a procedure 
which helps us integrate health and safety into a particular task or job operation. Uh, and you can expand this JSA or job hazard analysis, sometimes you'll see it called that, to, uh, to everything, not just safety, and think about what are the different aspects. So the trick with a, a JSA is to break the job down into appropriate chunks. So on the one hand, too big a chunk, if you say, as it says, if you define too broadly, we need to overhaul an engine. Well, that's a very that's a big piece of work with lots and lots of steps within it. So, so just thinking about overhauling an engine, you'll get some top level stop, stop, but not too much. But if you go too narrow, for example, say you know putting a putting a single screw in or a single fastener or positioning a car jack, that's probably too low a level. So we need we need um, to find uh, that sweet spot between you know a big job that's all encapsulated can't really see it to to too many little jobs where it's going to take a lot of time to analyze that for not a lot of benefit so really we need to take that big job and break it down into some sort of medium-sized chunks and then think about well, what are the hazards with this with this chunk and that chunk you know maybe you know, gaining access taking it apart I say gaining access, gaining access and making it safe before we start work, you know, all the way through the job to putting it back together again, testing it and then making it safe to use. OK. And restoring it to operation. So the trick with JSA is to get that appropriate level of granularity. And so, yeah, and as it says, we've got four basic steps selecting the job which we've talked about breaking the job down into a, a sequence of reasonably sized steps identifying the hazards and then determining controls so it's pretty you know there's nothing that dramatic about jsa it's just you know uh, the application of some structured common sense i would say which to be fair a lot of safety engineering is just st structured common sense and uh, yeah, so there's some more details here on doing a JSA. And the, uh, yeah, the Canadian website is generally is pretty good. There's lots of good information on here. And as you can see here, we've got some example forms for you to, to use. So that is JSA. Well, let's go back. Now let's talk about safe work method statements. Now, certainly in Australia, using safe work method statements is mandatory for high risk work. OK, and we'll see what high risk work is in just a moment. Now, it says it's not a procedure, it's a tool. But to be honest, it is a procedure. It's just a bit fancier and a bit more complicated than a JSA. All right. That's that's all. So. Here we go. So this is one of the information or one of many, many information sheets on the Safe Work Australia website. And so it talks about what is an SNS, when, what do I, what do I do, who should prepare it. It's using the idea of principal contractor in construction. This is this is an example for construction. So forget the principal construct principal contractor. That's a concept that's in um, construction law in Australia. There are many other examples of this that are not necessarily construction. OK. But SWIMS is mandated for lots of for high risk construction work because it is high risk. Let me just turn this round. There we go. So I'll just see. I'll just make this a bit bigger. So here's a great example. Forget that the stuff in blue, that's just filling in the form. What we're really interested in is these boxes here with the little squares, the little tick boxes. So here we've got some examples of high risk work. OK, so risk of a person falling more than two or three metres, likely to disturb asbestos, working near a shaft or a trench working near chemical fuel or refrigerant lines, okay, and so on. Use of explosives, 
diving powered mobile plant work in a confined space so all the things here what have we got here we've got uh, we've got 18 examples of high risk work here uh, or, and they're high risk because lots of people have been killed and injured doing them so this isn't uh, uh, this isn't theoretical this is this is very much based on real world so straight away we've got a prompt here we've got a, a checklist that's prompting us to say are you doing any of these things if you are you need to continue filling in this form and we'll come back to who does what so so as it says what are the tasks involved what are the hazards and risks what are the control measures so at this point we've gone back to sort of jsa territory it's just that that we've got a more structured approach a more formalized approach here because the risk is higher and therefore that's justified so yeah it's like a it's like a sort of souped up jsa and then it's a legal requirement for all the workers who are going to do this work they have to have ideally they should have been involved in preparing this safe work method statement but if not if somebody else has done a generic one and it's it's the same task or a very similar task the workers need to be briefed on what's in the safe work method statement and then they need to sign as you can see over here to show that they've been involved so the legislation actually requires this interaction so we've actually got a we've actually got recorded who who's responsible for assuring compliance who is responsible for reviewing control measures how will they be reviewed and when if this thing is to exist for any length of time you know what time when when was these swims create were created or received when was it reviewed and who reviewed it reviewer's signature so built into this form is a requirement for people to sign to say in named individuals did this assessment reviewed it signed and accepted it and said you know i understand this is what i've got to do and that is built into the legislation and then these forms they become a health and safety record and it's a legal requirement to keep these records for a certain length of time and to produce them when required okay by various parties so the regulator can demand to see these things a health and safety at work representative can demand to see these things etc and certainly if there's an accident they these these records will be seized and used in the investigation so this is like a jsa but much more formalized and, uh, and, and better structured and certainly in australia yeah it's enforced by law so uh, and there are rules about yes yeah, can can we use a generic sws swms and yes you can if it's appropriate but also you know there's there's quite a list of rules about how you do it so if you encounter something where you start off using a jsa or a jha and it turns out to be too difficult you know it's it's what, what you're dealing with is too complex for a jsa you feel try a safe work method statement whether it's mandated or not you know there's there's free is you know you anybody can get online and, and print this stuff off and use it uh and you know it's a good idea to do that i would suggest okay sorry let's go back to i'm trying to think okay so i've got to the end of my prepared webinar we've still got a few minutes left for questions so i shall just stop sharing and let's see do we have any questions from on any safety subject at all i'm not seeing any in the chat but i will all right well thank you very much everyone thanks for joining in and uh, i hope you enjoyed this morning's webinar and uh, i will be it's coming up at 8 30 in the morning here in australia and i will be back on doing the same webinar at 5 30 this afternoon or early this evening whichever you prefer so thanks very much everyone and uh, i hope you um
you enjoyed it. Oh, thanks very much, Greg. Thank you. I really appreciate your uh, your comments. And uh, thank you, everyone who's who's been online. OK. I will uh, just to uh, remind you again, uh, if you do have any uh, think of any other questions, uh, then please get in touch on social media or on the website and do please go and, and make use of those free resources. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye bye.